everything. Can you not get a bottle of Fontaine right. coffee? I think we'll do that. It's supposed to be liquor. Yeah, Mayer is not will not be a fan that I'm speaking the English, but it's fine. Oh, forgive me, but Alice, we're a crack off. You know that. Cameron Simon, ladies and gentlemen. Oh! Oh! Cameron Simon. Oh! Oh! Get both right. Fontaine coffee. I think we'll do that. It's supposed to be liquor. Yeah, Mayer is not will not be a fan that I'm speaking the English, but it's fine. Oh, forgive me, but Alice, we're a crack Cack off, you know that. <laughs> so does Mayer ha- hate Sotis? No, I don't think he hates them. I think like he knows we we speak Afrikaans, so I think it's like he he would prefer it if we do. I think we'll do some some. Afrikaans episodes in like, the coming yeah. weeks, you that'll, know, that'll be awesome because we have a few like guys that would I think rather express themselves in Afrikaans. Yeah, and I think I think man. you see that quite a lot if you guys if you're interviewing the fighters, especially it's like some of these guys just refuse. Like, JP Kruger, yeah, and it doesn't matter how many times you tell him, yeah, I can buy you, buy you, blessed, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then he goes into it. It doesn't matter how many times see us to pursue or I say to JP, you know. Talking off the cards or just I yeah. I also when he was on yeah I kindly yeah. asked him like please keep it English because most of the guys watching this is from mm. overseas yeah and uh, he he did well for the first twenty three seconds oh, that's and then it's just, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's and then it went over but uh, he's such a he's such a a, a cool personality yeah he's, well. a, he's a lovely guy yeah he's so you've met I you know we were chatting in the car on the way to the mall to Yas Mall yes. We were chatting about the guys that you have met and had the pl- pleasure of researching. And you mm. go very in depth with how you, like, how many cards, there were two cards back to back. How mm. many athletes did you have, have to? 12 and 14, so 26, so 52, which is, which is pretty good. Because sometimes UA Warriors, they'll have three fight nights back to back the Africa card, the Arabia card, the international card. So there was um, there was one event this year. I don't know if it's February. I think it was April. Yeah. And they had there was like seventy odd fighters. And the way it's set up is that the two color commentators and our lead they don't as play by play. Yeah. It's my job to because you know I'm not the best color. Okay. So I'm not. I'm not. You know, in terms of my jets or that kind of stuff. I disagree with that. The we've seen in verses you do very well with the technical you're technical too, side you're too kind you're yeah. too kind yeah. thank you and i think these days in mma and and there's something that you do well is that you can't afford particularly if you're a freelancer or if you're trying to make your way in the sport or in sports casting you can't start delineating what you are you can't say oh, i'm just a color commentator you can't yeah. say you've got a host you've got an anchor you've got a report uh, you got to do promos. You got to do sponsors. You got to yeah. do interviews. You you can't say I'm just a color. I'm I'm, I'm just a play by play. Yeah. But the, my particular role at UA Warriors is they never used to talk about the fighter when they walked out. Yeah. And if you're on UFC Fight Pass, you've got absolutely two strangers coming in, and for me, it's all about giving the fighters a platform. As prize fighters, do you just want to take your money and go away and disappear in obscurity? Just no. now you got to, it's not about it. Yeah. It's about building your career. And UFC Fight Pass particularly, as well as um, other promotions like EFC and Versus, yeah. particularly Versus with amateurs who are trying to get a name for themselves and get their license, you've got to give them that platform and you've got to pick yeah. them up. Now, if you're a viewer on a streaming service and you don't know anything about these fighters, they walk into the cage and no one says anything about them. Yeah. Why should you give a flying F? who these people are. They're two complete strangers. Yeah. You have to feel invested because, you know, fighting is a one-on-one thing. It doesn't rely on team dynamics where you're commentating on play-by-play and there's a lot going on in terms of relationships and how certain players treat each other as teammates. And that's a dip. Team sports are very different, different dynamic. Fighting is, is, a, is, is a Cartesian sport. It's about yeah. individuals. It's one person against one person. And all those rules kind of strip away. But if you're watching it, why should I feel invested? Why should I give a damn about this fighter fighting this fighter? So there's so many reasons why I think trying to figure out what makes these fighters tick, who their backgrounds are. Because yeah. also what makes MMA such a great, the greatest sport in the world is that 
It doesn't require amazing equipment. It doesn't require a great education. Mm. If, if you've got a fighting spirit, and there's so many people we know, our Brazilian uh, colleagues, for example, yeah. or a lot of our African colleagues who grew up in shitty circumstances in townships where there's a lot of gang violence and it's rough as heck. And if you learn how to fight in the early age, to fight your way out of the barrios or, or whatever, the, or your terrible situations or your family situation, if you've got that fighting spirit and you get a talent for fighting, you can uplift yourself out of that situation. And mixed martial arts, there's a lot of these kind of people who have fought out of uh, life's difficulties who have, have become stars in MMA. You can talk about kind of growing up in, in Crumlin. You can talk yeah. about Tembo and his, his story getting out of Zimbabwe. You yeah. talk about so many other fighters. Look at Aaron Abey from the Warriors, you know, cancer suffer stage three, uh, cystic fibrosis for his entire life. You know, he won the other night against Joe Vincent. So yeah. on the same card that Mike was, fi Mike was fighting at. So if you start to do the math on these guys and figure out what it is about them and talk about them as they get into the cage, someone who's not from their country, not from their community, who would otherwise not be interested in watching two fighters uh, enter a cage together, all of a sudden they're invested. All of a sudden they care about that person. They've got, I mean, I know a lot of other MA commentators do it. You know, at yeah. UFC, you and Drakus go in there and, and, and speak to one or two commentators who know what they're doing, or think, one or two who don't. Yes, um, yeah. we've uh, we've chatted about that off camera as well. Um, shout out to Daniel Cormier, but there are some <laughs> terrible commentators out there, and he's definitely one of them. <laughs> so, I'm glad you can yeah. say that. I mean, like, don't do myself out of a job, but I mean, but yeah. no, yeah. no, it's just like um, you you can see almost the the type you see it in in where like Netflix documentaries, the moment you get, you know, I, I always drive to survive as a great example because you do not only see their work at hand, yeah. you get to have a little bit of a connection with them because of the, the personal stuff that is brought up into the show. And then you can start relating to guys. So I, it was like, I never liked doing homework like at school or anything. Research wasn't a fun thing, but when we started now matching these guys up for verses, now it was like, okay, cool. Like, I can start doing some research on these athletes, maybe find a cool story, you mm. know, find a cool mm. story about you or whoever you're working with. There's always something that you connect to. And I think that's like, I think that's your job as a commentator as well to make sure that the people that are watching these fights also have a personal connection with the athletes. And I think to do that for 52 Athletes is <laughs> it's a lot of work. I see some promotions on a you know once in a while that one of the commentators or hosts and anchors will say we actually got two fight nights in a row. No yeah. one else does this. Yeah, you know it's amazing. I was like, yeah, not true. Yeah, and uh, you may have one or two uh, colleagues who, firstly, will also back you up on on doing their research too and speaking to the fighters during yeah. fight week and digging out those stories and those nuggets of information yeah. about them as fighters. But also, you may be working for global leading promotions who have a massive media team who provide you with a massive file full of research. You know, you can, you can mm. put your feet up at the spa at the hotel and just go through and, and, and someone else has done the work for you. Yeah. And that's not for me remotely the job. I, I hate yeah. that's lazy commentating. It's lazy anchoring. Yeah. It means you don't give a flying F about the fighters. Um, and you, you also know. want to shape your own narrative about 100%. these guys. Exactly. Your Why own... do someone else do, do the work? You yeah. know? But I've seen it again and again where poor commentators don't put in the effort and they're given the information by a massive media team. And at the end of the day, the broadcast product is poor. Yes. Yeah, frankly. definitely. Yeah. Well, it was such a pleasure, pleasure to work with you as well, you know, with, especially with verses because it's so hard. I can imagine guys in, cause we were in UAE. It was, we had a great time. We went to Yas Mall. It was, it was awesome. And then, I can imagine because some of those guys make their pro debuts, maybe have yeah. one fight. It's hard to do research on these guys because there's so. not much. Yeah. And it, I think on amateur level, it's even worse because especially amateurs here in South Africa, doing research for versus fight cards is, it's tough, you know? Yeah. And if you got <laughs> I remember I was sitting at the table doing the medicals, you know, collecting everyone's stuff. And, you know, you would ask these, these amateurs, like, how was preparation? And it's like, good. And then they would just walk away. <laughs> it's like, no, but like, tell me, is yeah. there anything I can go off? Yeah. And uh, it makes it quite hard because, you know, like you do interviews in the cage as well. And some of these guys mm. don't even speak English. Mm. And if they do, it's like, how did you feel in the fight? And it's like, uh, 
yeah, very good, uh, wrestling strong, and then they walk out. You yeah. know, so yeah. it is quite hard building a connection with guys like that. It is, and and it's but it's part of the. And I I like these days it's a bit more easier. I'll be honest with you because yeah. I think fighters are being told by their coaches and managers that the media side of it is part of it. Yes, you know you've got to represent yourself well if you want to. Um, impress the promoter if you want to attract sponsors if you want you know you've got 30 seconds opportunity um sometimes on that microphone because for me it's the director telling we don't have time for the interview or yeah. it's you got to wrap it very quick because some of the previous fights have gone the distance so you don't have much time to ask the question in the interview yeah. you've just got 30 seconds for some editor way after fight night to decide that's what's the, the what's worthy of going up on the insta page yes. of the promotion yeah. so you've got to give these fast and it's almost that goes back to the journalism stage of it is yeah. when you when you're asking a reporter out in the field you've got to get straight to the story you've got to st- what's the headline yeah get straight to your point and fighters have to think like that too and it's not about what you make of the question because it the question is an opportunity yeah you know you can give your answer you can give a two-second answer and then chat about whatever then, you want what, what's, yeah. what's most important but yeah. it's got to be worthy of being put up yeah. afterwards yeah. you know if, if you're on the live event on ufc fight pass and you give a good answer woohoo great for you mm. but if it's a powerful answer let's go back to um you know so how many times in the past like to barney on debella when he won i think it was the heavyweight in in, in the yes. ufc yeah. and his father had died that week and he broke down mm. you know and it's about giving him that moment yeah you know it's the same with um humphrey milenga he did that his mother had passed away um and literally he's in a fight camp and you go in and he breaks down yeah. and he just buries his head in my arms yeah. and cries and for me told in the microphone away yeah live on television and just giving that moment and saying it's okay man it's all right yeah this is your time and then saying and he's still not able to answer me properly then saying well we're definitely going to talk at another time so you will get the opportunity but at the moment this is obviously very emotional for you yeah. wherever your mother is i'm sure she's proud of you your medal, ladies and gentlemen, Humphrey yeah. Malenga. And for me, that is more powerful than any kind of smack talk, any call out, yeah. you know, anything like that. So it's about how you use that moment, not just as, you know, as, as a fighter, but as a person, thinking about all those things. Because it's a very emotional moment when you win and you've mm-hmm. won through adversity, your last fight, particularly going in with those injuries and still yeah. getting it. And you still milking the moment in, yeah. in, in, in your own particular personality camera because that's you yeah. but not not everyone's you and other fighters have to take advantage by what they are what their personality what kind of fighter they are and think i've got 30 seconds to make a difference and actually people must remember me whether it's other managers other coaches other camps other fighters other promotions other media organizations who are going to want to reshare that once it gets shared up another platform yeah yeah definitely and i think also like UFC Fight Pass is also a, a great way of doing that because mm. I think UAE Warriors is a great example. If they have now future talent going into the UFC, they can use almost ground level things yeah. to try and build that guy up even more. And you ha- you've had so much experience, you know, like UAE Warriors, EFC, and now Versus as well. Uh, do you use the same almost blueprint doing research on these athletes do you have like the same research strategy or do you is it is it quite different from athlete to athlete do you go on instagram <laughs> do you yeah. look for a everything. for a linkedin profile how everything. does it work yeah everything because like you said particularly with the amateurs yeah uh, with efc it's different because you know you and i live in this country so yeah. it's we've got a good understanding and when i've got the coaches' numbers, and yeah. sometimes if there's a guy uh, training from sub-Saharan Africa, I'll call, call Demar Penner up quite yes. a few times, yeah. and I'll say, Demar, who is this guy? You know, awesome. and, and just once in a while, I'll just shoot Demar. I spoke to him last week yeah. and just said, "Is this guy still with you?" Oh, okay. so he's moved here. Like, okay, you cool. Because also, you know, on those commentary you notes, know, sometimes the information you're given isn't always correct, yeah. and people change camps in this country so quickly. Yes, you know, and it's not always up to date. And when do you want to have your commentary notes when the fighter's walking out? better damn get it right because yes. you're then praising the wrong people and it, it gets it gets political and yes. it gets different. Um, so it's different for me here in, in Africa. But then the good thing about UFC Fight Pass is giving uh, the platform for a lot of uh, fighters who come from very small countries. Um, so the Filipino guy, Joe Vincent, so his yes. coach came to me and said, we took your fighter walkout video from... Like- Way back in the day, from like an earlier event this year, yeah. And because you mentioned um, Antipolo, 
which is a, a town in the Philippines that has not been funded and doesn't get looked after well by the regional government. We took that to the municipality. You will fire to walk out to help with yeah. getting a bit of funding for the gym and stuff. A lot of guys take the street children in. Ernie Bracker, for example, in Mindanao in the Philippines, got 30 kids, similar to you working with the youth structures. Yeah. It's got well, 30 uh, street kids in his gym. Yes. His gym is a, makes a terrible loss. He doesn't make any money. Yeah. But that's his calling because he's a man of faith and that's his church ministry and his part attached to the church, his gym, and does oh, all that kind of okay. stuff. So when you call that out on a fighter walkout saying, this guy's about to fight, but this is who really is. That's what's inside his heart, you know? And yeah. it's not, I wouldn't get the information, going back to your, your question, actually, I wouldn't get the information just by typing it in Google. Yeah. Because this, this, there's some real personal testimonies that yeah. make that fighter walk out so much more powerful because we always talk about that parallels between your life and MMA and why MMA is you just never know what's going to happen. And you can come from a, such a terrible losing position. You can get battered by the ground and pound. You yeah. can get taken a hammering on the feet. But in the end of the third round, you pull off some Hail Mary takedown and get the Kimura. That's the parallel for life for me. you know. Yeah. And you don't get that by going onto Google or going onto their social media platforms, which you do, which I do. Yes. Going onto YouTube, look at them. I mean, the amateur fights, not always available. Yeah. You know, I'm subscribing to UFC Fight Pass, which costs a fair bit of money, but it's it's worth worth, yeah. worth its weight in gold. Uh, UA Warriors has its own app, and before so they, they signed their streaming deal with UFC Fight Pass, they've still got all their old fights that oh, they used cool. to stream on their platform yeah. on there. But and EFC is also because, quite similar. They also have yeah. like backdated yeah, fights. Yeah, exactly. You get EFCWorldwide.tv, you can go and yeah. look on everything there. But it's fight week for me is is uh, indispensable because yes. you're getting those stories and you you understand and you're meeting coaches and managers who are translating for you and and, and yeah. you're getting so much background context and that for me is key because you'll have again I don't want to flog this dead horse of commentators who are so removed from the industry you know who just fly in day just day of the weigh-ins yes. you know and get taken to the hotel and they might have lunch and have some fighters come to them and they ask a whole bunch of cliche questions and that forms their commentary notes. Yeah. Being there during fight week and and for me a fight week's exciting. I love seeing that entire process of fighters arriving and yeah. talking and eating and people Meeting each well, other, eating not, seen, a lot. You know, <laughs> yeah. not a lot. Yeah, eating a lot. Yeah, but with with you, like I used to commentate your fights at UFC. And then I saw you once or twice in Vegas. Mm. Then now we work together in Pretoria. Yeah. Then I see you when you're cornering market, UE Warriors. And it's about maintaining those connections. Not, not obviously not just with you, but some fighters that you end up meeting and end up gravitating towards because of their stories. And sometimes the way they fight. You yeah. know, there's, there's, for me, I love to see quick scrambles and quick transitions. I love yes. it when it goes down. I'm not always a fan of the knockout. That's why I'm a commentator because, you know, all the yeah, fans. There's no, oh. No, fans, <laughs> yeah. fans love a knockout, yeah. but, but, yeah. but it's like when it goes to the floor. And I'm terrible at jiu-jitsu. Everyone will tell you I'm, I'm, I'm the I'm the whitest of white belts, but there's something about when a fight goes to the ground that's a lot more real to me. Yeah, you know that's real fight. The technical, you, you know. the technical. Yeah, fight like if you yeah. go to if you go to Thailand, I used to. Um, it's a weird thing. I used to commentate on Takrao, um, in Thailand. I did a program about Takrao. Have you okay. ever seen Takrao? No, no. It's 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 a volleyball net. Okay. And, and it's a rattan ball made of made of woven. Is that cane. the kicking yeah. videos? Yeah, you kick the rattan ball over the thing. Yeah. it's one of my favorites. How do you spell? What? A T A K R A W, I think. Don't necessarily quote me on yeah. that. But it's one so, of my favorite sports. Yeah, all, that's all, sick. I've seen of, videos on of, that. Of all type. Yeah. Um, but yeah, though, yeah, I don't know how I got navigated towards that, but yeah. Yeah, um, it's 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 great to to hear the, the perspective as well, because I think there's a lot of guys that um that almost take it for granted. I don't. I, I, it's almost like take what for granted. Uh, the, the 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 production side, the commentator yeah. side. Yeah. Like I think if if the if there was no walkout music, no one talking, guy just walking out fighting. <laughs> I think you'll lose viewership quite quickly. Yeah, UA Warriors never used to do it. Yeah. Okay. And and there was when I first arrived, it was October last year, twenty twenty two, and Cyrus Fees asked me if I can come and back him up there. Yeah. And they didn't have, they didn't talk on the fight to walk out. And, and, and when I asked the production team why, they said it's because they have, a, it's, it's the, the broadcast is split into two for the Arabic commentary 
and then the English commentary on UFC Fight Pass. Okay. And it was something to do with the music rights for the walkouts. It's something that a lot of promotions deal with. The EFC is the same. Yeah. Uh, where you don't have the copyright for the walkout music. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, you know? that's something Versus also struggles right. with. Right, it's, yeah. it's, it's a problem unless you're, you know. Yes. You know, Endeavour. Yeah. Uh, which is fine. Um, so I would say, well, you know, the reason why I can't commentate over the final walkouts was because the ambient noise from the arena's PA system would come through my open mic whilst I was commentating the yeah. fight to walk out, and then, and then they can't afford to pay. But now they've figured out um, how to uh, how to, how to kind of isolate my voice a bit more on the fight to walk oh, out. Sick. So, but it's something I really, really pushed for because, like you said, you got a fight to walk in out to silence. Yeah, and it's like there's no hype, there's no atmosphere. I remember, it, like on the Contender series. Walking out, no music. There's like oh, maybe really? 200 people in the crowd, but then all I could hear was the comments. At the apex. Yes, at the apex, and yeah, it was just like it was such a weird feeling. It's yeah. like, and no one's cheering as well because I'm fighting an American, so everyone's like, but why dead no music? Quiet. Uh, I think it's just the way they they try and do the contenders. It's like. Yeah. It's raw. You walk out, you push those doors, and you just walk through the. So cage. you could hear the commentators during the fight. Yes, and that that's weird. Yes, it's like, weird to do from it a as fighters. Well. Yeah, from a fighter's standpoint, hearing commentators is like he's getting hit now. It's like, yeah, well, oh, you, you, just get, it, get in here. Try and not get hit now. So. <laughs> but also, when you're commentating there, literally, you're. If, if I'm at my commentary position, the yes. apron's here. Yes, you're down on the ground right in front of my commentary position, and I'm saying. Yeah, there's a lot of ground and pound. He's getting hurt. He needs to yes. get out of here, right? <laughs> but if 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 their opponent's hunting, if you're hunting for an arm off your back, yeah. he says, well, the arm's there, the kimura's there, he's going to throw up. He's got nice rubber guard. He's throwing it. Your opponent can hear yes. what I'm suggesting he should be doing. or And, and then the coaches can hear. Because, yeah. like, it's an empty arena. Yes. This happened a lot during EFC just as we were coming out of COVID. You know, yes. We still have a lot of public weren't allowed um and it's like your voice is booming because yeah. don't forget with at the efc cyrus is in tennessee yes. commentating down the phone line and the fact that a lot of uh viewers aren't aware of that i think is a testament to the chemistry he and i have because yes. it's a very very tricky thing yes it's hard particularly for him yeah because there's a delay and and we're still able, able to make it work yeah. but it's it, it's your right it's, it's my only voice Echoing throughout there, an empty arena, and everyone is hearing what you're saying. Yeah. It's like, if you don't know your shit, it's like the emperor's new clothes. Yeah. You know? And frank, <laughs> thankfully, I've never been called out. But I can imagine as a fighter how weird it, it is. It is weird. Even like in a big arena, when you talk, you can almost hear yourself back from, from the speakers because mm. there's a, a slight delay. Yeah. And then that's also the most weird. It's such a weird thing for me. What do you think is like the most generic question you can ask a fighter? What do you want next? <laughs> okay. Yes. You know, yeah. But it's what's, it's what's it, next? It, it's still relevant, and it's yeah. something. But you know, I try, I try to avoid the cliches. So the first thing, and it's something I'm working with over time, is when I go into the into the into the cage to interview the fighter, it would be, well, I'm here with. Yes. Because for me, and there's a, there's two different schools with commentary. It's always a case of some some believe that you should just be uh, explaining what you see in front of you. Yeah. But the viewer can see that, you know, you, you have to like tell them what the viewer is seeing because yeah. they don't need that explaining. It's like, well, I'm here with Cameron Simon. Obviously, I'm here with Cameron Simon. You can see that. I don't have to tell you that. That's yes. a wasted sentence. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yes. but it, it's, um, you know, it, it, but it, so when I go into the cage, I don't, I don't try not to say I'm here with. Yeah. I immediately go into my first question. Okay. Because it forces, it forces firstly the director and the cameraman to turn on to us because a lot of fighters will be celebrating with the corner or still, you know. Yeah. So I go in straight with a question Yeah. because it, it drags them over to me. Um, it impels everyone to, oh, the interview's starting straight away. There's no fancy introductions. I've got no time for that. Mm. And I do try and avoid, you know, what's next for you. But for me, uh, some, a lot of the fights are about fighters trying to get up the rankings, and so who's next for you is, is obvious. I do try and think more about what happened in the fight, but some, even though it's an absolute crazy blur. Ask about the fight camp. and there's, But the cliche, from the ultimate cliche is, is what do you want next? What's but next? sometimes it is relevant. Yeah. But too many commentators have turned it into a cliche because yeah. they can be lazy. And so there's times when I think it's a viable question, yeah. I don't want to answer it because it's become a cliche because it's a go-to. I also think it's how you how you answer it. Is it's going to make it a good question or not. If so what do you like to be asked? I, I do think like 
what's next? I think if you are climbing the ranks and you're in the top 25, top 20, and you are looking to call out someone in a very aggressive manner, you know, there's a handful of guys. Obviously, Connor on a mic is just absolute gold. Mm. Derek Lewis, just hand that guy a mic. Everything he says will be clipped afterwards. You yeah. know, so there's like <laughs> a handful of guys, yeah. you know, Ian Gary speaks very well. There's And these are just now UFC You're examples. You're becoming quite but, Ian Gary fan, haven't you? You talked about him the other day. Why? Yeah, I, I do think like his mental, I think his mental approach and his thoughtfulness around everything he does. Mm. I think he's very aware that there is a camera on him 24 seven. I think he's aware that the moment he does something, it might be received as very good or very bad, but I eyes will be watching. So I do think like he might, he might even fall into a trap where the reason why he does that is for the eyeballs, which yeah. I obviously you don't want to do that. You don't want to fall into that weird social media rabbit hole of just trying to create viral content. Yeah. But I do think his mental approach to, to how he is doing everything is quite thorough. But your answer earlier was very correct by yeah. saying, give the answer to the interviewer, Yeah. but just use it as an opportunity. So like 10-second yeah. answer, then move on to what you really want to say. Yes. A good yeah. example was when Drickers fought Darren Till. Yes. The press conference afterwards at the T-Mobile Arena, when my, my main question was, uh, what is for yo? Yeah. And he goes, Vacancy. Begun to, yeah. And then he went into the Paolo Costa talk, uh, a call out, yes. which obviously didn't happen because for all the best reasons, actually. But he was like answering my question, but moved quickly on to what he wants yes. next. I didn't have to ask him yeah. what he wanted next, but he knew exactly when to take the opportunity to say what he wanted to say, but he's still able to answer my question. Yeah. And that was beautiful Afrikaans, by the way. I really, oh, I man. enjoyed that. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it is a, it's a very, it's a very, I think, important role. I think you're playing a very important role. And before this as well, because you, you worked on the, you also worked for ENCA eh? mm. and before yeah. you went into, are you now full-time just doing the f fights, fight promotion? Full-time commentary, yeah. 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 Okay. Is there, is there a reason why, like, why fighting? That's always what I like out of all the sports you mentioned now that the, the Thai kicking sport as well. I yeah. can't imagine there's a lot of money in, in that sport, no, but no. it was, did you always gravitate towards fighting? Because I remember in the car ride uh, uh, to the mall, you mentioned, you know, training at FFM mm. and doing, mm. being in martial arts for, for a few years, being exposed to that sport. Was there a reason why you actually approached or not approached, but went down this amazing MMA rabbit hole? Well, I was only at FFM for a couple of months, but it was really to learn. You know, I went to Richard Norm and said, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this show. Um, you know, I'm, I've got this idea about training a little bit to give myself a little bit more insight, you know, and I, I bit off more than I can chew. It was, yeah. it was tough there. My injury started ratcheting it up, and I, yeah. I, could, I couldn't take the pace at FFM. And yeah. that's given me more respect for a lot of the fighters training. That was actually what it was for. You know, you go in there and start seeing, thinking if you can hang. You know, I couldn't, you know, yeah. I could do it. And that's that's gives me that kind of respect for the fighters that are able to train daily at that level. It is absolutely unbelievable. And Richie and Norman says, yeah, come in, you know, no problem. Yeah. And they were so welcoming. But I would never say I was, I, I trained at FFM to the point where, oh, that's where I go to train. I'm, yes. a, I'm, a, I'm a fighter. I would never, I would, I would never claim to be that way. Yeah. But I grew up with jiu-jitsu and, and Kempo particularly. I trained yeah. at a Kempo tournament. Um and I got knocked out when I was young. It's a story I sometimes tell to fighters who, because I find the losing fighter a lot more interesting than a winning fighter. Yeah. And I think it's my background. Um, my parents sat me down. I'd cried all the way home. And, yeah. and I was 13. And my parents said, um, we don't think this fighting things for you. You know, I could never go to your training sessions because I don't like getting hit. Yeah. I think there's two kinds of people in this world, those yeah. who can deal with being hit and those who can't. You know, and it's like when you're on the floor and you're getting ground and pounded, to have the wherewithal to have some that part of your brain that says this is what i need to do yes i, I find under that amount of pressure find that yeah. very interesting okay. um to tell you can keep your cool that way um but it was yeah my parents sat me down to this fighting thing's not for you but they knew i have to they'd have to replace it with something so my dad took me to work the next weekend he was um he used to be an engineer on outside broadcasts for itv sport oh wow okay so that's when i and then so i got my apprenticeship when i was 16 in in outside broadcast and audio post production at, in nottingham at central television and that's what got me on the this career path 
Um, I dropped out of university after a year. I was at Surrey studying music. And I went back to MTV Europe, who had offered me a really nice job. Yeah. And MTV got me into African music. I then applied to be do my honours um, in at University of Natal Durban, or UK, as I don't know yes. is it now. Um, I met my wife there, or my, my, my wife. You know, we have two beautiful children. I live in South Africa, which I think is one of those beautiful places on God's earth. How lucky are we? Like, we're pretty lucky, It doesn't get right? said often. Yeah. Doesn't like, get said to you often, but yeah. I've got a lot of hope for this country, and yeah. I think it's an amazing place for me as a, as a foreigner to live here. I'm privileged. Yeah. But none of that would have happened if I had not got knocked out yes, when I was well, 13. Yeah. And it, 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 it processed a chain mm. of events that completely changed my life. And, and so, so sometimes when, you know, as a commentator, you can see someone knocked out. You know, there's always, and I say this quite often, it's become cliche when people ask me that, and I say, there's a part of me when you're supposed to be excited. Everyone loves a knockout, right? Yeah. Fight fans. Yeah. You know, and you come and you're supposed to get excited. You're supposed to, what a great oh, knockout, all what? that kind of stuff. Yeah. But there's a part of you inside that's like, damn, I hope he's okay. Yes. I hope that he'll come back. Or there's a part of you inside where you know there's a small, when your consciousness is taken away, it's almost as if you feel a little bit robbed. It's a strange feeling. Yeah. And I've understood it. And I had a sensei at the time who was great with winning fighters, you know, the kind of like, it was a long time ago and there was no understanding of how to deal with amateurs and headgear and all that kind of stuff. Mm. But he didn't know how to deal with a losing fighter. Yeah. And I find when, but the best thing about MMA, to go back to your question in terms of why I'm drawn to it, is that to fight your way out of real shitty circumstances, and that includes losing and losing terribly. Like, I always wanted Ben Askren to come back after the Masvidal because yes. I, I loved his grappling. And I interviewed him once when he was at one championship, and I found him a thoroughly engaging guy. I wanted to come back from that fight, but it kind of like that's what kind of like bookended his career, which I'm yeah. upset about. But when you speak to a losing fighter and you kind of like speak to them about how they're able to get back in the gym and, and fight again and fix what they fixed and come back even stronger and better than before. It is a cliche to come back from adversity, yeah. but it does happen in MMA, and that's what I'm drawn to. It's And that's why with losing, with, with winning fighters, great. They deserve all yeah. the victory and all everything that comes to them for, for, for what they achieve. Yeah. But I find a losing fighter getting back on the horse is what I'm drawn to psychologically and, and from a personality point of view. This yeah. goes to who I am, who I came from, you know, where, where I was. You know, I had two working class parents. My dad started as a dockyard worker. Mum was a, was a cashier yes. in a shop, you know. Um, and it was it's a case of you just trying to better yourself. And a lot of fighters are exactly like that. You know, I lost my father when I was young to cancer, yeah. which is why when I talk about the Aaron Aby, you know, I, I get quite emotional because he's an inspiration. Yeah, It's like you get drawn to different people, but just people who fight their way out of such difficulty and such backgrounds and uh, stories of abuse and substance abuse and poor upbringings and all that kind of stuff. That's what I love about this sport. Because it really can change. It's the cruelest of sports. Yes. The lowest of lowest, as I'm sure you're aware. Yeah. But the highest of highest. That's yeah. what makes it glorious because it's – and for me also with, with, with as a sport, it's – there's no pig's bladders. There's no lines. There's no there's, – there's the unified rules are there for decency. You know, yes. like eye gouging and <laughs> yeah. crotch shots and finger manipulation and fish hooking, all that kind of stuff. So there are rules there. But essentially, it strips away. We try to civilize sport so much. We mm. try to, in this day and age, we try to, we try to like create these contexts of rules and boundaries that kind of like strip away the soul of what it is. Yeah. You know, I went to. I know you're you're a golf and a rugby fan. I went to. Um, it was the Bulls against the Sharks yeah. at Kings Park in Durban, Curry Cup. Yeah. Um, and Kankowski was flying down the wing to score a try, but someone had like. There was a bit of a disagreement in the stands uh, between, oh, yeah. actually, between two shark supporters, not between the bull supporters. Yeah, enough. yeah. <laughs> and they started a fight, and everyone turned around to watch the fight in the stands at Kings Park, and everyone missed Kamikowski. He ran down the try line yeah. to score in the corner flag, but everyone missed that because they were watching the fight. Nothing as great as a fight. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's so. what that's what draws you. That's what draws yeah. the sport because it's it's undiluted. Yes. There's none of these, these rules. It's one person against one person, you know, in, in a realistic fight. When I say well, I like the grappling and I like when it flat goes down to the canvas, that's the fights you see when I grew up in school. I used to get into fights. Yes. You never see a clean walk-off knockout in the playground. Yeah. Yeah. Because they start rolling on the floor, yeah. you know, and smashing and start ooh, biting each other, pull each other's hair. <laughs> it's, it's the most realistic support. It's the most rawest of sport. And yeah. it speaks to something inside of us. That 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 um, yeah, I think we try and 
civilize the crap out of our competitive spirit. And that's yeah. the vibe MMA for me is one of the best sport in the world. Yeah. That's awesome. It's awesome to hear your experience as a as a commentator, anchor as well, an interviewer and a journalist. And uh, we prepared a few a few videos that we actually want you to to react on. Oh, and um, right. maybe it brings up some old memories at ENCA. Maybe you have a, a few stories to tell us, but I, okay. I think you're going to enjoy this. So, okay, um, cool. We'll be back. 12 seconds later. You've had a lot of experience in the newsroom. Yes. You know? And yeah. <laughs> I do think <laughs> just like when you do interviews with fighters, sometimes it's very hard to try and not steer them in the right direction, but get what you need from them. Sure. You know? Yeah. And that's why we pr prepared some... I'm pretty sure you've seen some of these things, but um, we've prepared some videos for you to watch. And okay. uh, yeah, just just let me know what you think. As a if you had to put yourself in that perspective as a reporter, okay, um, maybe a journalist, even a news anchor in some of these videos. Um, so okay. yeah, here here it goes. One resident describes her horrifying experience when she first realized the complex was on fire. Well, I woke up to go give me a cold pop, and then I thought somebody was barbecuing. I said, oh, Lord Jesus, it's a fire. <laughs> then I ran out. I didn't grab no shoes or nothing, Jesus. I ran for my <laughs> life. And then the smoke got me. I got bronchitis. Ain't nobody got time for that. Oh, I love that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> like, would, I love that. Would you post that? Like, if yeah. that happened at, like, NCNA? Hundred percent, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I'd, I'd counterbalance it with something a bit more insightful about the story and like <laughs> okay. the facts. Yeah, but that's the reporter's job is just to say, this is the fight, this is how it's happened, this is what they're investigating. But that's real local color. That's like, and she's being herself as well. Yeah, she's not putting on any front. So many times when you put a camera or a microphone in front of someone, they kind of like freeze up and they're like, yeah, I was scared, or they or they, they get very frigid. Yeah, she's really expressing who she is with her local accent and her voice and a yeah. character comes bounces out on the screen. Yeah. You just want to cuddle her. I think that's <laughs> awesome. But you don't get that very often. Yeah, you don't. I I still remember Trevor Noah had a joke about like how someone from Cape Town would describe a a plane crash and yeah. how a, a british guy and he's just like this old guy we were flying yeah and then a few moments later we were flying no more <laughs> and then that was his whole story that's yeah. literally what they posted on the news right. so i think i would much rather go <laughs> with with that type of reaction to it yeah 100%. she looks very happy for someone whose house just <laughs> burnt to the ground I mean, you know when you put a camera in front of someone they do change a little, they often change obviously she thought you know she's on network news so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but trevor noah slamming the brits never <laughs> trevor no. noah reading out a story you know a joke that someone else wrote for him never <laughs> anyway sorry, anyway, uh, anyway. <laughs> i didn't force anything down anybody's throat i didn't make anybody stay here until 7 a.m. or 11 or whenever it is everybody finally left i didn't make this kid pass out on my floor <laughs> people wanted to be here that was their decision yeah that, 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 that is interesting that's how would you approach <laughs> i can see on your face you're just like you know, i don't know what to make of that yeah. you know it's, it's yeah, obviously it's like, it's a bit different having a news report with the person still passed out on the floor. <laughs> Looks dead. You know, I'll check on him first, yeah. but I certainly wouldn't have them, wouldn't have them in shot. But it was a strange story. It's like, it was like a, he hosted a rave in, yeah. his, in his home and yeah. the neighbours complained. So the news went to check it out and there's a person still passed out on the floor. I'd just perhaps... Uh, Move the camera to the garden outside. This is a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so that wouldn't make the cut. No, certainly not. No, but that's funny as hell. As it's a news editor, it's... I wouldn't. I wouldn't, uh, okay. I, would, I wouldn't post that. It is. It is. It is um, interesting. Okay. All Check right. this out. Intruders Very caught on camera invading houses. So could something like this happen to you? Dave Rowe knows all too well how it feels to have his home <laughs> broken into. Yeah, and see, that's what the problem was. Because I heard him first. I said, "Hold on." I said, hold up, wait a minute, something ain't right. Because then I start to taste them. I say, <laughs> and then I start to smell them. So it's like a smell that like, tastes like, I was like, so I knew something was wrong. I knew something special about it, you know? So, <laughs> so what did you do when you heard the intruder? I ran upstairs. I had to run. And I had to do with that little girl. What's that little girl uh, in the Holocaust? She had a... Uh, she was Ann Hathaway and Frank, Frank and Beverly. <laughs> Ann Frank, that's a hiding bitch, ain't it? <laughs> I had to get up the stairs. So, 
Oh, mate. I think. Oh, that's great. You, you've had to hold your pose probably a few times, just like doing interviews. Yeah. Like doing any anything type of like where an awkward situation like that arose. No, I'd ask him, how did you taste the intruder? Because <laughs> that's the most interesting thing he had to say. Yeah. So as a reporter, you can see the interviews going a particular direction that you don't <laughs> yeah. necessarily want. But then why don't you work with it? Yeah. Go with that flow. That's the skill of it. Yeah. Sometimes with live news, you never know what's going to happen. But the key is to embrace that. So I would say the tasting in the air is really interesting. Is it a unique skill that you have? <laughs> How did you do it? Have you done it before? Have you did you have you realized your talent for tasting other people in the air where they don't belong? Yeah. Because that's the best bit about the entire interview. Yeah, he, he just painted a picture with words, right? Yeah, there. he really yeah. did. But then how do you <laughs> how do you, <laughs> I don't know, but, but like the other thing is is again, you know, if it's not if he's not being authentic and he's telling, you know. He's not telling the truth. Yeah. It, it could be the case where, again, hey, I'm on national news. It's my 15 minutes of fame to quote Andy Warhol. You know, I'm going to take advantage of it by being out as outlandish as possible. And that's always a, tro- you know, a problem. You don't know what is fake news these days because people are really seizing the opportunity for a little bit of fame. Yeah. You know? yeah. And all fair play to him, mate. Why not? You know, it's the reporter's uh, job to, to um, call that out, mm. you know, and then – balance the news editor has to balance it with a decent voiceover script to actually say, well, this is what really happened. Yes. You know, yeah. You can't, you can't put that out there and then everyone goes, oh, okay, that's really fascinating. Without, <laughs> yeah. without the newsroom in some way saying, okay, well, this is his opinion. This is what, this as, is what, happened. As, as what we found out. Yeah. <laughs> I would love for him to tell me stories, just like anything. Just tell me a story, please. What do I taste of? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the girl come downstairs. She come out her apartment with her baby with no shoes on. I said, oh, girl, it's cold outside. She said, something ain't right. I said, oh, man. She said, oh, man, the building is on fire. I said, no, what? I got my three kids and we bounced out. Uh-uh, we ain't going to be in no fire. Not today. <laughs> I love it. That's cool. Yeah, again, local character, you I, know. I'm, I'm uh, just thinking like a lot of these guys, are, they are very excited that their house burnt down. Yeah. They, they, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tragic type of thing to happen and then be so excited for that. Do you think there's like insurance payouts? Or do you yeah, think- you'd have to question why, you know, if you lost all your belongings in a fire, you'd be devastated, yeah. you know. Um, and you, you, you see other parts of the world, you're particularly in South Africa, for example, where there are shack fires and informal settlements. Yeah. And these you know, people don't have much material wealth, but even then, they're absolutely devastated. They've got no idea how they're going to come back for it because there's no support from the local municipalities or the NGO because, hey, African National Congress. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, it's completely different to that. So you'd have to ask the question, is it, is it cultural difference? Or, you know, again, is she, is she like just loving being on camera? And perhaps the best thing that's happened to her life yes. is the local news organization coming along and asking her about the apartment fire. Yeah. So it's hard, but again, counterbalance it with the facts. Yeah, yeah. You know, have you got any South African just, clips or all these? No, these are, but purposefully, yeah. we 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 went abroad. Okay, just fine. so right. know, we don't want you to get in trouble. Okay, but, uh, oh, gee, thanks. We, we have. I we don't have work in news anymore. Thank, well, thank the living lord. Have to still walk their dogs. Here's a young boy we talked to earlier. It's a pretty tough way to walk a dog, isn't it? Oh yeah, for sure. Very inconvenient for anybody. It's got to be done though, right? Yeah, it does. I don't want to pee all over the house. I got to clean it up. Yeah, that... That's a bizarre one. Firstly, why is the audio so ambient? <laughs> you know, well, they are like, in a lake. It's like <laughs> so... it yeah, it doesn't sound like it's in a lake, but it's obviously the way the feed has been taken. Have Have you had to know. do that much trouble, just like walk through a river to try and interview no. someone? No. I mean, not... I wouldn't... What's the end result? Is it worth it? You know, <laughs> can you not wait for them to get to the shore yeah. before you do that? But or get, then, to, get to a roof or, you know, something. <laughs> I guess it's a, it's a unique situation that you want to capture by going into the river where the guy with waders on and interviewing him. But it's not as if he gave you much. You know, I don't, <laughs> yeah. want, I don't want him peeing in the house. But, like, so you're not take, you're taking him for a swim during the – yeah, weird one. Would have that made the cut for you? No. <laughs> not? I don't know. Yeah, I guess from a unique point of view, but <laughs> – 
You know, again, if we bring it back to the local situation, some of the floods we have in South Africa, again, there's no room, I think, for that kind of levity. Yeah. Because it's like, that's a unique situation. You know, yeah, get in the river with the guy with your waders on because he's carrying the dog for a walk. Ho, ho, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite, it's quite funny. It gives a levity. But you do that in South Africa where, you know, people get washed down storm drains and we lose children. And, yeah. Um, it's from the shack fires, the floods that happen, um, you know, the floods in Durban particularly, look about recently, yeah. were so devastating and so awful that, no, I would not go in there with that kind of levity whatsoever. I'll just report as somber as it is. Yeah. You know, because, again, it goes back to local government being completely fucking useless. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you go back to Durban, even go to the East Coast in case and now, you know. I'm sorry you have to people this out, but I'm quite passionate about it. <laughs> you know, there's people still who are homeless in Durban. There's still mm. a lack of infrastructure and building across that East Coast of Kaiser Yeah. After those floods that happened, what, two years ago And then ago that happens, whatever? that causes, well, it doesn't cause you know? it to happen again, got but no it does water. happen. People got yeah. no water, no electricity. Got, yeah. Their houses got washed away and they're still homeless and they're still, you know, um, at the mercy of, you know, God knows what else. Yeah. Know? No, I would. That would, that would not certainly not make the cut. Yeah. You want me to be jokey about this? I'm just being far too serious. No, 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 no. It's definitely. It's just like, it's it's great to hear your perspective as well All because right. it, it, we are just wondering why would this make the cuts? You've worked in a newsroom. It's yeah. just it, it does not make sense at all. That these okay. Well, then are, let's give a bit more context yeah. then. So with with the American organizations, it's 24 hour news. Okay. Um, there's no real 24-hour news channel in South Africa to the, to the point where after 11 p.m. the bulletin's recorded and and, and yeah. played out repeatedly until the morning show comes on at five or six in the morning. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with the American news organizations, they have this massive. You know, you you know about CNN and C yeah. CNBC and Fox and all that kind of stuff, but they have so many local affiliates that oh, every okay. county in every state has a local television station that's affiliated to the big umbrella organizations, right? Yeah. So local news in America is massive, you know, and rightfully so. Um, and they have a, a large pool of resources to uh, cover a story in so many different ways. So after that report of the guy you know, taking his dog for a swim, they'd probably throw back to studio and then we'd have a, a graphic with how the floods actually happened. And then yeah. you throw to another reporter who has an interviews, then you go to a guest, a climatologist in the studio, and yeah. then you throw it back to another location where you're looking at seeing how it's managed politically at the local town hall by the and the mayor's giving a press conference yeah. from earlier. Then you replay some of the best stuff. Then you have some of the shots the public has sent. You cover that story in so many different ways because you have the resources, not in terms of just out in the field, yeah. but your production capacity within the actual news building and the newsroom to cover a story from so many different angles. So that's why that jokey little piece would be more than justified in terms of that kind of coverage. In so South Africa, we do not remotely have the resources, which is why we kind yeah. of stick to the facts and, and tell a story straight up rather than anything else. How do they Yet make we, money? Uh, television news yeah. like yeah. in South Africa. Well, uh, the SAB get the taxpayers money and they get okay. uh, and they get like multi-billion rand payouts as it happened three or four years ago. Um, Usual Africa, it's a AFP. So a lot of the programs are funded by sponsors yeah. and they keep, you know, DSTV, uh, do, of my understanding, do a special deal for Newsroom Africa, um, but they get a lot of their money from ad revenues. And the same thing with the ENCA. ENCA belongs to eMedia Holdings, which is part of ETV. So, you know, you're, you're part of a network pool um, within a holding company. So, you know, you, you make your money from, the ad revenue that's yeah. supposedly supposed to be the model. SAB, SABC get the bailout from the government. They get the license fee for your TV, your TV license, and they keep all their their advertising revenue as well. So they have multiple revenue streams. And then you have on top of that, you have your, your programs, as I mentioned, individually sponsored by corporates. Yeah, um, it's very very difficult. Um, news is a, a an incredibly expensive operation. To yeah, run. and if you're an independent commercial uh, news station like News from Africa and ENCA. Very, very difficult to yeah. head above the Chris Fye yeah. just feeding it okay. out to that 454 down lane. And look at this pin action. Oh. What did he say? <laughs> look at this. Chris he was Fye just like, he's a bowling commentator. 454 four down lane. And look at this pin action. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I've, just, I've never seen that before. <laughs> but that would be uh, that would be cool. Eh? Yeah, you'd be kind of limited to what you can say about ten pin bowling. Yeah, definitely. Hey? I, I I do think they fall down or they don't. 
Well, he made it interesting, uh, I guess. Like, he has an absurd passion with it. Yeah, I don't know if it was the pinballing or it was coming. But, uh, <laughs> it was an interesting one. 15. Oh, those are your lucky numbers. Can I tell you what? Do you know your chances of winning? Slim to none. Slim to none. You're <laughs> right. Let me tell you, it's one out of 292 million. What do you think about that? I knew it. You knew it. <laughs> your, your numbers are lucky, though. Am I right? I hope so. I hope so. Can I ask you, if you won all the money, what would you do with it? Bunch of hookers and cocaine. Oh, okay. That's not good. <laughs> we were hoping for a different answer. That's probably not the answer that we're looking for. All right. No, oh, she did. She did. She did well with it. You know, <laughs> she she rolled with it. Yeah. You know. Um, that's on live TV. That's for, live TV, yeah. And you, now on social media forever. Yeah, you know, you just never know what someone's going to say, but I think she dealt with it really, really well. Good for him. He was he was drastically honest, you know. <laughs> she, tell, when she told him his chances. Yes. You know, well, you know me, I only gamble when you fight, where Jokers fight, so uh, I, okay. I, I always win. So he would, it'd be a lot better going to the sports book and put, putting money down on you guys <laughs> instead of going yes. to the lottery. Have a, a way more better chance of winning. Okay. Box. Have you ever had anyone be like super rude to you? Well, I was never a reporter at ENC. I was an executive okay. producer. Okay. So I, I, I you know, I helped. But even do like that. the backlash of like some star, they they must have been some instances where, as a producer, that you are being put pressure on to maybe release a story. Some people don't mm. like it. Mm. Was there? Is there that? That conflict. Huge, yeah, huge amount of political interference. Yeah. yeah. Where newsroom management will then. Give me a call. There was times during the July riots, yeah, in South Africa, for example. Yeah. That was it was uh, the the management of the stories and and Zuma, um, his his initial early arrests, um, uh, the Zondo Commission for State Catcher Inquiry. There was a lot of uh, political interference yeah. in in the editorial processes of the company. That was one of the reasons why you know I, I eventually left. Yeah. Um, but nothing compared to the inner toxicity of the of the working environment. Yeah. That, that so many people left the NCA and continue to be traumatized today. Yeah. Yeah, that's scary. Okay. Well, those guys oh, pretty good. Right. Okay, let's have a look. Let me know when you're ready now. Yeah, we're ready. Yeah, say and spell your first and last name, please. But what you want me to start off? Say and spell your first and last name, please. What? Say and spell your first and last name. Okay. They call me Handman. Okay. All right. What's your what's your what's your real name? Ozel Gary. Okay. Will you spell your first real name? Huh? Spell your first last name. First you can't name. read. My oh. name Ozel Gary. Okay. Well, I need to know how to spell it. Well, I'm just letting you know. I'm down here from Detroit, Michigan. Okay. I born raised him. Okay. I lived here 33 years. I thought things might would change, but I see he ain't changing okay. no more. Can I can I get you to spell your name for me, please? Oh, like he, he's quite fed up. Yeah, 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 but she just should explain because yeah. she's asking him. So back in the newsroom, they can write his name strap, yeah, correctly. And there's been times in the past where you know I've I've, I've taken a lot of flack uh, when my producer has not put the name strap up correctly or okay. spelt it right or what they yeah. are or who they're representing and stuff like that. So initially, uh, at the beginning of an interview, you should always always ask. Can I ask you what your name is, what yeah. you do, who you work for, and please to spell it correctly. Yeah. So that the producer back in the newsroom can type up the name track correctly. She's actually showing him a lot of respect by asking him. Yeah. But then she should obviously he's having difficulty understanding her. So yeah. she should just be saying, I I want to spell your name correctly because yeah. you, you get the recognition you deserve for the fact that we're interviewing you. But yeah, you know, at that point, you know, kind of move on. But, yeah, but she should have explained. But he didn't seem to be the brightest tool in the toolbox. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, Would a, you then just go one. go to someone else? I'd know. I'd go into the interview. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then, but you can figure it out. You know, you can go to the phone book, or you know, I, I, how Gary is. I'd figure out his surname pretty okay. Yeah. Um, no, you can you can do the work. Yeah. You can get a producer back at the newsroom saying, "Listen, if you can't." Find out what his name is by looking on these common names, but what it sounds like phonetically. Yeah. Um. If you can't figure it out in the phone book or by the voting records or anything like that, then do a facsimile. Give it your best shot in terms of what you heard, because a guy like that, he may have something golden to say. Yeah. You never know. I mean, I always ask at the end of the interviews, um, "Is there anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to say?" When I did a, I did a, um, a documentary. I'm still working on with the Nazareth Baptist Church of the Shembe's pilgrimage to the Holy Mount of, N of Ntlangakazi. And culturally, you, you're, you're translating from English into Zulu, and you're asking a whole bunch of questions, and yeah. they're trying to give you the answers they think you want. 
Yeah. And at the end of it, it's similar to what I ask about fighters. Yeah. You know, when I'm doing my commentary notes, tell me something about you that will blow the fight fans away, that yeah. would surprise them, that they, you know, that that's something different about you, a hook that would actually make people think, well, oh, crikey, you know, yeah. Cameron's into chicken porn or something like that. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the... I'm not. I just do. <laughs> well, we know, we know different. But, <laughs> but no, I'm joking. You know what I mean? Like he's, yeah. a, he's, a, he's a great cook or he yeah. works for the police service as a volunteer or something like that, you know. Yeah. So we also ask at the end of the interviews, there's something I haven't asked you that you'd like to say. And it gives people like that an opportunity to say something about their lives that has nothing to do with the story, but may just absolutely blow you away mm. and justify why they're speaking to him in the first place. Yeah. So, so explain why you're asking to spell the name. If you're not getting it, go into the interview and try and figure out afterwards and, yeah. and get the get the real stuff you want from that person. That makes sense. Yeah. I don't think this guy got what he wanted. Well, so to be honest. Like actual right. customer out here. Uh, what's uh, what's the best kind of firework to buy? Wouldn't you like to know, weather boy? Where are your parents? Get sketchy. Back to you. Guys. That sounds like a rehearsed line to me. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's real. It it, it looks quite real. Um, but would you slap a kid if he did that? Oh lord, no. Not. You get taken to jail for that, especially if it's live on air. Okay, what if you low kicked him? You can see like it's from, <laughs> it's from, <laughs> from the waist down. It, there's no you, camera. You, you probably do that after the camera's not rolling <laughs> yeah, and yeah. turned around and say, what the living fuck was that, you <laughs> piece of shit? Because obviously <laughs> you don't just find a kid yeah. outside a store yeah. and just randomly interview him. I imagine that the reporter went up to the kid and said, hey, do you mind if we ask a few questions yes. about your favorite firework? Yeah, no problem, great. And, and then, then he throws reset. you under the bus because yeah. the kid thinks he's going to get his five minutes of fame. Then great, you do. But after the live, you turn around and have a couple of chats. <laughs> you, know, you know, but he's got a good question. Do your parents know you're here and stuff like yeah. that? Anyway, isn't it illegal to buy fireworks at your age? You know, if, if I was a reporter, I'd think about what Fox Five is doing by asking underage kids why they're buying fireworks in the first place. Yeah. I'm going to go speak to the shopkeeper because it's illegal to sell that shit to you. I'll put you throw, throw, throw it back under the bus. Those, those things are so dangerous. Yeah. No, yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's all we have. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Is there anything that <laughs> I have not asked that you want the people to know? Really? Is this the end of the show? Yeah. I want to ask answer. you about Rodriguez and the, the, has the opponent changed? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. No, I'm fighting Christian Rodriguez. Somebody put yeah. up a different opponent the other day on social media, and I was like, what the hell was that? No, 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 no. I'm fighting Christian, yeah. And what do you think of the Rosas Jr. fight? I think it, I was not surprised at all. Oh, like, really? Yeah, to me, it's, the moment that fight was announced, I called uh, Jason, who d does my ta tailoring, yeah. and I was like, oh, yeah, Ro Rosas is losing this fight. It's just, it was as clear as day. It was just one of those fights where... I've never rated Rosas to to begin with. Like I think he is technically very sound, very yeah, good. Yeah. But I, I do think that most of the division will find answers. Yeah. Christian did that and it's a great fight. I think he obviously has a big social backing now. Um the fans want to see him fight again. I hope they want to see me fight again as well. We've been very active, so I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna be it's gonna be a cool one. And it's at the Apex. It's so, at the Apex again. Yeah. It's a fight night oh, event, but I'm looking forward to that raw, maybe quiet. I I might I'm I'm going in with, you know, thinking that there's not going to be a lot of um fans f for my side, yeah. but uh, I'm I'm ready for mentally. Uh, it's going to be cool. And versus what we're looking forward to coming up November versus Fight Night Seven, we are looking for 18th of November. And we have a few surprises with, with that card. So we have a few very important meetings this week. And then we'll, Sounds good. Yeah, then we'll be back. It's going right. to be sick. All right. Like yeah. Thanks, Cam. I sort of get yeah. those two in. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should have started with that, to yeah, be honest. Yeah. <laughs> actually, actually. But we'll clip it. It's fine. <laughs> it, will, it will be sent out. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe. And if you have not yet, go check out Simon Stevens. His links will be down below. You can go check it out. In my opinion, one of the best commentators in the world. It's a pleasure. Oh, mate, thank you. Thank you so Appreciate much. It, mate. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers.